All right. Awesome. All right, 12 o'clock, right on the dot. Awesome. Um, all right, welcome everybody. <clears throat> this is uh, the 12 o'clock session, Better Agile Drupal Sprints. 12 ways to start and keep your projects humming. Um, how to leverage Jira, there's a number of ways you can call this. Um, my name is Chris Urban, I'm from Acquia. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in a second, but just wanna make sure everybody knows they're in the right room. It's 315 Symphony Hall. Okay, everybody's in the right place, awesome. Uh, so let me tell you quickly first, uh, just a little bit about me. Hopefully this is a scene familiar most of you, uh, your typical sprint meeting. Um, I'm the guy in the corner. I'm the scrum master. Okay. So, um, I already told you my name. My name is Chris Urban. I am a manager uh, in professional services at Acquia. Um, I've been using Drupal since 2008, and I'm a certified scrum master. I'm a certified, Acquia certified site builder, D7 and D8. Um, I come from a marketing, actually publishing background. So, long, long time ago, Back when there was no internet, it was magazines and newspapers. So that's my real background. Um, today, oops, uh, what I want to cover um, is about your projects, um, how you are building your Drupal sites, and how we can hopefully overcome a lot of the issues that you face day to day, um, most specifically in how you use Jira for tracking your work. So hopefully the tips that I'm going to give you today will help improve those projects. You'll have something to take back and try. Um, but for first thing I want to start with is, you know, how do we get here? Why are we talking about this? So number one, everybody wants their project to be successful. And while your one of your tasks is to keep your development your development team busy, right? They have work to work on, there's a process in place. It's for all those times where things don't work. And that is really the heart of my message today. How can you make sure that those times where things don't work, that the project doesn't break down? What are the ways that you can improve that? Um, now, number one, I like to make this more conversational than just lecture. So if at any time you have any questions, raise your hand and ask me. Uh, hopefully we'll have enough time at the end. We can do Q&A. And I'll also be downstairs at the Acquia booth. Um, come find me there if you have questions, if we don't have time but most importantly, have fun. All right, so let's get started. Uh, first thing, just some basic assumptions. I don't wanna waste time talking about it because you already all know the um, Agile methodology. Hopefully you can see this, how to build a product, right? You iterate, you start with a skateboard, you work your way up to the car or the pickup truck. You don't add tires and then the floor and then the body because what if the guy who's doing the tires never shows up? You're kind of stuck. If you start with a simple model, that's, um, that's how you start. That's the idea behind iterative development. And again, ensuring this process works, there's a lot of talk about how you're supposed to do development sprints. My job here today is to fill in all those gaps about what happens when things go wrong. What happens when people don't know what they're supposed to be working on? Does the product owner know what the development team is working on? All those pieces of the puzzle. Okay. So, um, you'll see this throughout the course of the presentation, just to give you a little preview so this doesn't shock you. Uh, we're gonna play a little game, you know, I'm gonna ask you what this is and you're gonna tell me one word. So, anybody wanna take a guess what, this, what these things are? Burn down chart. Oh yeah, it's the worst burn down, burn down chart in the world, absolutely, because you can see it's like nine months and I haven't gone anywhere. But in general, what are these? Problems, Problems exactly. So what we're gonna go through today are all the real problems. What are the things that happen to you in a project? And most typically, you get chaos, right? Anything that leads to that kind of event. You've got maybe multiple product owners giving you concurrent requests. Your team doesn't know what to do. Nobody knows who, what's going on for the sprint demo. What tickets are we grooming? Who owns what, right? Where, how does that work? So hopefully, where, what I'm gonna give you here is the keys to make all of this successful. So this is going to be your foundation. Um, now, 
the first thing to have a solid foundation for a project, absolutely paramount, is communication. This is that part about the agile development that we don't see in that nice diagram with the scooter to the car. How does everybody communicate? Most importantly, all the processes need to be shared. Everybody has to know exactly what their job is, and that ensures trust. If everyone on the team trusts that everything is documented, everything is written down, and people know where to go to find the answers they need, then you can get back to the business of getting the project done. Having the key knowledge on the project shared. So, let's play a game. What's the first thing we need to do in communication? Documentation, that's the fun part. So this is my list of things that you really should have documented. If you don't, get do it right now, like start writing it. Even if it's just a summary, this is the stuff you wanna have documented. Now, the scenario I like to give for this sort of thing is imagine you're taken off the project and someone is put on your place. Would they know where to go, where to begin, where is everything, right? Um, and I have all these posted online, by the way, in the session, the PDF is already up online, so don't, don't worry about taking pictures. Um, does everybody know what workflow state they're responsible for? Do the developers know they're you know, ready to code review? Do the QA engineers know to pick up tickets in the ready for QA state? And so on. Have that documented and spelled out. A RACI, or RACI, depending on how you want to pronounce it, a table that outlines whose job is what. That's probably the most single important thing. This could be just a basic spreadsheet with each role on the project, right? Lead developer, a developer, senior developer, QA, product owner, anyone else involved in the project, release manager, who does what on the job, and outline are they the responsible party or are they just the informed party? Where on that spectrum did they land? Um, then the last one is, I call it the objective rules and playbook. Uh, playbooks. This is the catch-all for everything on the project that everybody needs to know. Again, think of the example, somebody has dropped off the project and needs to come back on cold. They have no time to get ramped up. Is there a one-pager that outlines all of these steps clearly, right? What do you do when a client gives you a request to fix something at four o'clock on Friday when everybody's going out the door at five? Do you have a process for hotfix handling? Do you know who needs to be asked to get approval? How long does a deployment take? What are the alternatives? Can we wait till Monday? Write it out as a basic question and answer flow diagram and having that documented, shared, and everybody on the team aware of that document makes a decision like that objective and not emotional. And that, when you have a problem on Friday at four o'clock, is the first thing that happens, right? Everyone starts freaking out, running around like chickens. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? Pull up the document, step one. Is it really a hot fix? And just work your way through. Okay, let's have some fun now. This is the documentation side, now we'll get to the JIRA side. This is my favorite part because I am a JIRA nerd, yes, and I use JIRA for all our projects. In, at Acquia, that's standard issue. We do cloud hosted accounts. A lot of customers bring their own JIRA instance. Um, so hopefully what I want to give you today are the quick and dirty list of things you should be doing or try to do. All right, so the first one. This is hard. This is really hard. Queries. You, know, you find a picture for queries. <laughs> so let me first stop right, uh, first and ask a question. Who here has used JIRA or is using it regularly? Show of hands. Okay, awesome. Yes, I'm with my people. Um, <laughs> So what I, if you don't know it already, what I strongly recommend you do, this is, I, I warned you this was advanced, is to learn some JQL. If you know any kind of structured query language, you've played with MySQL or you've played with any kind of database querying, then you kind of know it already. Um, and you can learn it very quickly thanks to the way Jira is set up. Hopefully this will show up. So if you go to your issues and just start doing a search, the default is to give you the basic setup and you'll see a list of selections up at the top, just start picking things to find what it is you're looking for. And once you've built that query, go over to the right and click on advanced and it will turn it into JQL for you. So right away, 
I have now my first query. What's the project? What kind of issue type? And it's once you start understanding how the query language works, the difference between an equals and an in, the exclamation point equals for not, you kind of get your whole set of rules. So just as a like absolute 101 primer, these are the first ones you can start with. Like I'm looking for a ticket in a project. I'm looking for tickets in the project that are only bugs. I'm looking for tickets that are bugs or stories. Okay, easy, right? All right, next one. Anybody? What is it? Columns. Yes, it's not easy. It's not hard. So in Jira, you think of get some more coffee, people. All right, maybe that's the problem. I've got too much caffeine in me. When you run a query now in Jira. Um, your layout looks like a table. You get a list of results. Uh, quick side note, um, if you don't know the key shortcuts in Jira, T, just T, no control, no command, will toggle between that column view and the detail view and go back and forth. If you're in this column view, you can arrange the columns you, any way you want and you can pick what columns you want by clicking on that columns button all the way on the far right. Very, very handy because how many times you wish you had an Excel spreadsheet for all those tickets to give to your customer. Now you can just crank it out and just send them a link and say, hey, I got it right here. What do you need a spreadsheet for? So everybody knows this, right? A show of hands, anybody who's familiar with this already? Okay, so good. So you're learning stuff already. Awesome. All right, next one. Filters. filters. See, this is easy. All right, so sprint filters. This is my, filters you can do for anything. Once you've learned a query, you can learn to save it. And once you save it, you can share it. Either you can keep it to yourself and nobody else can see it. So very often I'll do that. But then more importantly, when you start a new sprint, um, instead of having to go to the board, just create a filter that says project and sprint equals the current sprint and save it and share it. By doing that, you can share that filter with everybody on the team. They'll click on the link. They'll see that report. They can make their own columns. They can change that filter however they want, but they get the same list of tickets that you're looking at. Remember at the very beginning, what did I say was the most important thing? Clear communication, making sure it's consistent and easily available. Sharing a sprint filter, by the time you get to sprint 10, you now have a list of all the links to sprint one, sprint two, sprint three, and so on, all readily available. Now, one side tip, don't name your sprint one, sprint one. How many people have done that? Because if you do, when you start working on a large project, you're gonna get everybody's sprint one. And how do you know which sprint one is yours? So first thing I advise is either give it an ID number or, and the project name. Like, you know, I'm working for XYZ company, sprint one. And that will make it a lot easier for you because then you can just start typing in the project that you're interested in. And I, like I said, I don't know how many times this has happened to you, but that drives me crazy. So make sure you name your sprints, your filters and your sprints appropriately. Okay, now how to do this really quickly. One other thing to make sure you're aware of is when you create a sprint filter or any filter, by default, it's only yours. You have to share it. So very at the very top where there's the save button, there's a details link, you click on that. And there's this really kind of clunky UI where you have to add people that have visibility. Typically adding everybody that's on the project is a good place to start because you want everybody on the project to be able to see your filter. See, this is all coming together. All right, any questions on that? All right, let's go. Next one. Tags. No, labels. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay, I can see you yeah, got tags. So labels. Uh, anybody here using labels in Jira? Frustrated because there's so many of them, right? Okay, so labels um, have an infinite number of uses. The most benevolent of these that I see is for your sprint demo. So you're on, let's say, day eight or seven of your 10-day sprint, your two-week sprint, and you and your product owner are figuring out what is it that you wanna show off because a stakeholder is coming to the demo. Um, so how do you quickly mark the tickets that are gonna actually be demoed? add a demo label and then you can run a filter query for this sprint plus label equals demo and now I have a pre-built list of all the tickets that are going to be on the demo. You don't have to build a spreadsheet. Done. You save that filter and every sprint you will have this sprint's demo tickets, right? 
which is what the developers need to see. Is that something that I'm demonstrating? Does the product owner know that those tickets are being demonstrated? You can manage that any way you want. But now, building on that query, add in a label, and you can kind of see how we can use this. Using it more for actual filtering and not just for the customers marking it as urgent or whatever kind of crazy labels your client likes to do. Okay, next one. This is hard. Components, awesome. Yes, components. Components to me are the most underrated feature of Jira. And for us in the development world, it works perfectly with content types. Um, it's a perfect one-to-one. -one. So if you're working on tickets, you typically have them arranged uh, by epic, right? So for example, you're working on a, let's call it a news release content type. You've got theming tickets, you've got backend tickets, there's a view, there's a whole load of stuff that's associated with it by the epic. You may have your theming in another epic. By adding a component to that ticket now, you have another way to organize those tickets in a somewhat more Drupal organization. And the real benefit is th of this, at least one of the ones I can think of, is regression testing in QA. So imagine you're in your sprint and the last couple of sprints have been all over the map because you've got work on this thing and the theming and a view and permissions and workflow and there's something wrong in the home page. So the home page is a good one because everything feeds into it. How can you quickly find the last couple of sprints worth of tickets where something may have broken something on the home page? You can just go back to the component for home page and find the tickets that were associated with it not having to look for the epic or was it a view, was it back end? You tag it while you're doing grooming because you know that ticket affects that area or that functionality. Now you have another way to find that work more quickly. This is really helpful when you're working on large projects and I mean like multiple development teams, multiple product owners and you've got like 50, 60 tickets a sprint. You wanna find something in the last three sprints? Do you really have time to go through 150 tickets? use something like this and this will let at least narrow it down and you can find likely candidates that may have affected that regression. Besides the content type, there's other areas to use and it's just about the typical functionality. Is it around content editing? Is it around image editing? Um, is it around analytics, advertising? And so this is my list uh, that I like to use. And again, this is posted in the PDF so you don't have to take a picture, you can copy and paste. And we'll get better because I'll show you how to load this into your project like that. Um, but you can see I have content types, I have integrations, and then there's like everything else. Error pages. How do you work on your error pages? Do you have an error pages epic? Probably not. At least you have something now that it's usually a bug ticket. Now you have another way to organize those tickets. Okay. Next one. Think plural of the singular. Tables. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, who here is using Confluence along with Jira? Okay, fair amount of you. So, if you're not already aware, you can insert a filter in your Confluence page. And that means all those queries that we just talked about, the list of demo tickets, the list of tickets in the current sprint, are now instantly tables on a Confluence page. So, you can take that query that you just built and now stick it on a page. And you can organize exactly what columns you want to display. On the bottom right corner, it lists all of them. Like, do I really need the issue type when it was created? Probably not, but I do want the summary and the key. This is, again, think towards your product owner. The people that you're working for, are they able to see what it is that they want to see? You can edit this and uh, customize this as you see fit. Um, so two examples here I've put in is a, a page that is specifically dedicated to all the work that we've done lately that's specific to the content type article. Because for this imaginary client, that article is the big feature that they want to work on this quarter, this sprint, whatever it is. The first question you always get, get is, oh, what are we working on uh, in this sprint towards this feature that I've told you a million times we want to get done? Now you have a page that automatically updates. You don't have to go back and generate a new report because that's a waste of your time. You have th better things to do. Save the query, build a page, and you're done. Okay. This is, yeah, I'm from Philly, so forgive me for the obligatory cheesesteak, but it's not cheesesteak. <laughs> 
This is also a really hard one. Subs, can you? That's a stretch. All right. <laughs> Subtasks. Cheesesteak sub doesn't, okay. I had a sub, but nobody got it, so I figured it might have some fun. All right, so in Jira, you can use um, subtasks. And what a subtask is, is when you're in the ticket, uh, a story, a bug, anything, you can add a subtask right away. This is really helpful when you're doing planning for that next sprint or grooming. So a typical case is you've got a ticket where there's someone else involved that's not normally involved on the day-to-day -day process. A good example, design. You're working with a company and they have their own internal design and marketing department. They need to review you know, how this theming work looks before it's sent to off to QA or to the product owner for UAT. So you add a subtask that says, don't forget to get the input from design and add it as a subtask. So now you have a marker in the ticket, more prominent than a label, right? Because the labels get lost and everybody can see if it was done or not. And more importantly is that you can assign it. That's the big one. So in that case, so-and-so needs to be asked if this data is available or whatever that task is. Another one is, let's say it's a very large or complicated ticket, add a reminder basically to say, hey, uh, let's check in on this product on day five and take an extra couple of minutes after Scrum and make sure that we're on track because it's really important we get it done. You will forget when it comes to day five, right? Because you're in and out every day Adding a ticket right on the board, it's in your face, everybody sees it, everybody knows that we need to check it. Again, clear, consistent communication to everybody who's on the team. Okay, next one. Ceremonies, it's a little hard, okay. You're already hopefully using a daily stand-up. You're using a, probably a sprint and review and a retro um, and a demo, and you're hopefully doing ticket grooming. Are you doing sprint planning? Is anybody doing that at the beginning of the sprint, like you're supposed to? Okay, good. So if you're not, you should. And a good way to keep this short and concise is prepare a document that is shared with everybody that lists the tickets that everybody is committed to for the sprint, but more for the product owner, for the customer, is to announce what are the real goals of the sprint in English, not we want to get ticket SP1155 done. It's that we want to be able to uh, a, lo a user can log in and change their profile. Like what's the feature, what's the elevator pitch that a person at the customer's side can say, we're working on this and it, it got done. It's yes or no. Like can we show that the news releases now show up on the homepage? That's a goal, right? Have the top two or three major features or goals that the customer thinks as the most important things in that sprint, put it in a table and that at the, end of the ta at the end of the sprint, when you're doing your retrospective, you can just say, did we meet this goal or not? And now you have a metric for qualifying if the sprint was relatively successful or not. If you have three primary goals and you've met them all, that's a successful sprint. If you have three primary goals and none of them got done, they all turned out to be way more complicated than you thought, and they got carried over into the next sprint, that sprint wasn't as successful. But now you have an objective, unemotional metric that everybody can be judged against or everybody can see how they're progressing against, right? That's the important thing. Um, another thing you can do, obviously, if you have time, is assign the tickets to a developer. This is a, a sidebar note. We won't have time to talk about custom fields, but if you're not using it already, I would strongly recommend a custom field for a developer. You have the reporter, you have the assignee, add a developer because as the ticket goes through a workflow, you won't remember who worked on the ticket and nobody has time to read through 50 comments to find out who it was. Okay, next one. Easy. Pruning. Pruning, yes. So I'm not saying this is my project, but the numbers on the side you probably can't read, but the top number is 420, 400, 380. This is the days in the issues log that were unresolved. So hopefully your backlog doesn't look like this, but if it does, probably does, you need to do some pruning. So this, I try to make, this is, this is the actually, I know I'm a nerd, this is the fun uh, ceremony to do because you can take your customer once a quarter and say, we got a lot of shit in the backlog we need to get rid of. Let us spend an hour or two hours and just go rapid fire through tickets, use a filter that says, 
find me everything that hasn't been touched in over 14 weeks. That means it's stale. That means nobody cares about it. It's not going to get done. Make a rapid fire decision to close those tickets. Just get it out. If it's really important, you can create another story. But this way, you're not going to be having to filter through that massive backlog of cruft. Get rid of it all. So I say do this quarterly. It's fun, especially for longer, longer term projects that are running like 9, 12, 18 months. Anybody? Take a guess. Grooming, yes. Grooming. So if you have, oops, if you have multiple product owners on a project, right? Not just one, but two, three, four. You have a larger team and you have to get your grooming done. It's the product owner's responsibility to get those tickets groomed. They're the ones who are going to bring them to the team and say, I want to get this feature done. Is this ticket ready for work or not? If you have three or four of them, now you have competing, conflicting interests. How do you maximize efficiency of a grooming session when everybody walks in with their top 10 list that they want to get done and you only have time to groom 10 tickets? So what I suggest is, first of all, time box it. So you should allocate a rule of thumb I use is about half an hour per product owner per session because every, after a while everybody's going to go crazy. And you really want to figure you should not need more than five minutes per ticket to groom it. If it takes more than five minutes, the ticket's not ready, it needs to go back in discovery. But if it is ready, your team can size it and move on to the next ticket. Now, the way I do this is I set up a worksheet with a grid by product owner, and I put in, they put in the tickets they want to groom, and they tell me when they're available. So if I have two slots a week, let's say a Tuesday and a Thursday, or a Monday and a Friday, sometimes one can't make one and another one can't make another, now you can fit all the pieces together and organize a grooming schedule that is actually more efficient for everybody. So I know I don't have any tickets being groomed on Tuesday's call. I don't need to attend. I can do something else. But my tickets will be groomed on Thursday, so I'll make sure to make that one. It makes it a little bit a better relationship for the customer, and it makes it more efficient for your team because now you've actually got stuff to go through. Um, there's a couple of assum uh, assumptions, like I mentioned. Make sure you have a hard deadline, like you really have to time box it and keep things moving, right? But if you do this, if you have four owners, you can go through a list of tickets like this in easily in an hour, um, if not less. Yeah, question. You have multiple, is that multiple product owners on the same team that's selecting the work? How do you manage the conflicting interests and priorities? So that's, that's exactly it. So, well, for grooming alone, you have to make it fair, right? So if they're all using the same development team, let's say, and these are my three product owners, they are the ones responsible for getting their tickets into the next, getting it ready for um, development. And then in the planning meeting, you have a meeting with all of those product owners and you decide, okay, we can fit X number of points. What really needs to get done now? What can wait a sprint? What can wait three sprints and so on? Um, for larger types of projects like that, you usually have to use another tool on top of JIRA like AHA or um, a Gantt chart to kind of map out the amount of sprints you need to get a feature done to make sure that you have enough time to get it done. And there is a little bit of trickery with that. But for this argument, this is just about the grooming itself. So that's like the first step in that chain. Um, but yeah, a good question. In terms of the beginning of the sprint, they have to hash it out among themselves. It's a fist fight, basically. Or horse trading. Like, yeah, let's make this a stretch ticket, or we can wait a sprint. We really don't need it right away. So just set up a document like this and share it with everybody on the team, all the product owners, and they fill it in, do it at the same time. I do one, let's say one per week, and then everybody knows what tickets are going to be groomed. And this also gives the developers a little bit of lead time to actually go and read the tickets ahead of grooming to say, yeah, this one's not quite ready, or I've got a question, or this is really easy. Um, and that gives them a little bit of time to be prepared. Now, the other part of grooming, obviously, is pointing or sizing the tickets. Um, and so I like to use uh, pointing poker. Um, this allows everybody to keep it fair and keeps the voting time so that you can watch that five minute clock. Um, and you can arrange it how you want. So all you have to do is just type the ticket in. I'll have another window open. I'll show you what it looks like. Um, you just go to this site. You, 
either join an existing session or if it's yours, you type in a, a session number um, and you have a lot of options. Um, you have to put in your name, you can join. Um, most importantly is what you're gonna be using. You wanna use t-shirt sizes, you wanna use a Fibonacci sequence, you wanna use hours, whatever it is. And for product owners, they can join as a non-voting person, as an observer. The nice thing is that once everybody votes, and I'm doing this with only two devs here, but the idea is I cast a vote for eight points and then everybody else votes. And if everybody votes the same thing, you see consensus. Or if you see that everybody's voting different sizes, you see what the tally is over on the right hand side, over there, right? So I see that I had an eight and a 13. In a typical pointing session, I may have, let's say, three eights and one 13. Then I can say, okay, so and so, you voted 13, what are your concerns? And now you get right to the heart of the questions that are being asked by the developers. Why do they think, why do they understand to be more complicated than it sounds? All right, any questions on that? Okay. Yeah, you're not gonna get this one. It's not one word, it's two. Tips and tricks. Okay, so a couple quick other things just to throw in here to round these out. Uh, one is um, using, this is all kind of using the ingredients that I've started giving you now. Um, I like, because I like color, because the sprint board is pretty boring, I like to use queries on the back side to color the code, uh, the tickets um, by, for example, a custom field or some other combination. So in a case where you have a large project, you may have multiple teams, like, you know, let's say North America, South America, and Europe. You have development teams in each region. You could make that a custom field, and now you can share a single board, but color code, you know, Europe is blue, so I can see what the tickets Europeans are working on. Green for South America, and I can see the ticket says green. Uh, I'll show you what this looks like in a second. Um, another is when you're in the backlog, create a sprint just for organization. You don't have to ever open it, but now you have like a holding bin. You could call it like the ice box or you know, tickets we really need to focus on for the next couple of sprints, especially if you have a lot of stuff in your backlog because you haven't done pruning and you have 400 issues back there, you can pull out, let's say, the 10 or 20 that you need to focus on. Just create another placeholder sprint. Um, the last thing to make sure if you've not done this before, and I, if we have time, I'll show you how to do this, um, set up multiple boards. You don't have to have one master board or one single view. You can make one Kanban and another one Scrum. There's no rule that says that they all have to be the same. So from a product owner perspective, that's a Kanban board for the UAT state, right? It's ready for me to look at, I'm looking at it, and I'm done with it, and that's it. So just put those three workflow states in one board, and that's specifically designated for a product owner. You can do the same thing for QA. You can do the same thing for the code reviewer, right? Coming out of ready and going into code review. Um, they don't have to be time limited. They don't have to be a typical scrum board. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by this color coding and the swim lanes. Um, and for example, uh, I have another label here, stretch. What if you add a ticket to your sprint because you've got capacity, you wanna show that that ticket was added. Yes, JIRA will show that it was added to the sprint after it was open, but you wanna be able to label it right away because that means it wasn't originally planned for, it's almost like icing on the cake you can make it its own swim lane in the backlog, and now you get the customer to not focus on the tickets that were icing on the cake, but really the tickets that we started this sprint with. Does that make sense? All right, so in the back, if you go to your board and you configure it, for example, here I'm using, um, is this not playing? I guess not. You can use um, queries, and you just type in, for example, I wanna have a labels equal stretch. And so now if I add that and I go back to my board, if I have any tickets that I've added, they show up in their own swim lane, basic. The colors that you see here, blue and gold, those can be either also additional queries or let's say in this case, I'm assigning it by team. So let's say the blue is the US team and the gold is the India team or whatever you want. But now you can see who's working on what and you can say, oh, the blue team is way ahead of everybody else and gold, what's going on there? So I can already see some more reporting and everybody sees this and everybody knows what you're doing. Again, the example is to have clear and consistent communication on the product, on the project. Okay, uh, one more. I think this is the other example with the queries for the card colors. 
right, so here I'm using, I gotta find the ticket. Yeah, I'm using extra custom fields and here I've got a team. So now I can say PS team is blue. I can see right away that how that team is performing. So now I'm just assigning it by card color and I'm using that label team equals whatever the name of the team is. That's it. It's a little bit of effort on the upfront, but once you have it in place, you can adapt and adjust this any way you want. I'm just looking at one custom field, but it could be anything. It could be by size. It could be by component. Let's show me all the content news article uh, tickets in one swim lane because there's a product owner that is just on my back all the time about those tickets and I don't want to set up a separate board. Give them their own swim lane. Okay. Now we get to the fun part. Kittens. Who the likes not kittens? REST API. <laughs> yeah. Did everybody, get, did everybody go to the pre-net this morning, by the way? Did you guys have a good time? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, has anyone used the REST API in JIRA? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Let me start with that. Anybody have a clue what I'm talking about? Okay, a couple of you. Good. So this is really getting to the meat of this. So if you have a JIRA instance, you can add this to the URL and add your query as a string and you get a JSON object back with all that data. So instead of looking at it from a board, look at it from a pure API perspective, you can hit JIRA and get whatever pieces you need. This is just one endpoint. There is a ton of them. Um, and I'll give you the URL for it, but this is the best example right out of the gate. So if I use that query that I just told you about before, projects equals uh, you know SP1 and issue type equals bug, I pass that to the end of this string and I'll get a JSON set back and I get a count, 35. So what this means, and let's see if this, everybody's gonna connect the dots here. I could build a Google Sheet with a bunch of fields and query my JIRA and build any kind of report I want. So you can run a query on JIRA that says, show me all the tickets in this sprint that were reopened from QA specifically. And I can get a count what that number is. Or show me all tickets whose component is article or whatever, anything you want, as long as you have a query that works. So you can go to a Google Sheet, build that query, pass it along, and oh, sorry, this is the uh, endpoint for all the REST um, endpoints on JIRA. You'll see a long list, and I'll go through like three of them here. But you could build anything you want. So here, I'm going a little crazy, but you get the idea. I've got, you know, a half a, do a dozen sprints, and I see the number of tickets, I see the number of stories, I see the number of bugs, I see the number of stories specifically for the FV group, whatever that is. Um, how many of them were reopened? How many of them were reopened specifically from QA? How many of them were opened specifically from UAT, right? That means the guys that caught it on my side, the, the tickets that were caught by the product owner. You ideally don't want to have any tickets to reopen from UAT, and I'm, this is all fake numbers, by the way, so don't think my project is as bad as it looks, please. <laughs> But the idea is once you have this, now in Google Sheets, there's awesome charting tools and now you have a nice fancy graph you can say, hey, look, our overall quality is improving. You know, why are these bumps here? Why is the gold spiking here? What happened in that sprint? Ways to start conversations with your, with your customer. But this is way, way more detailed than you're gonna be able to get out of JIRA and easier because you already know how to use Google Sheets, right? Okay, Chris, this is all great. How the hell do I do this, okay? Easy. You use this function. That's it. I know, real easy. So <laughs> I have instructions. Um, this is basically one variation of the function call. And um, I have this in GitHub and it's, I'll come back to this, it's here. You can download it, plop it into a sheet. I have you specific instructions how to do it. You go to the script editor in your Google Sheet. You add this, you have to uh, you know, give it permissions. The only piece that's the most important is you have to add your username and password, right? Because it's Jira, you can't just go to it, you have to authenticate. So if you authenticate, the endpoints that I mentioned, you can query, but you have to be authenticated in the same session. This is another way to do that within a, within a function call. So all this is already, you don't have to do anything, you just copy and paste this, and all you do is on your sheet, type in the query, project equals project, type equals anything but a subtask, and the sprint was 11.22. Remember at the beginning I told you name your sprints with an ID number? 
So now you have a reference because you know what that ID is and you can make queries out of it. Okay. It's a lot, right? Okay. I got more. This is going to be awesome. All right. Next one. Standardize your projects. This is a lofty goal, but um, my hope is what I'm going to be able to show you is a way for you to standardize your projects because a lot of time is spent getting stuff set up at the beginning. You start with a blank slate, a new project in Jira. You have to go back and add all the tickets. You have to add your epics. You got to add your components. All these things have to be added in and you usually do it by hand. Now, if you've ever imported stuff into Jira, you know that you can export, let's say from a Google document or Excel, a CSV list. And as long as the fields line up, you can import all your stories in one giant pass, right? All you need is like a summary and that's it, right? I mean, bare minimum, ideally, summary, acceptance criteria, implementation details, descriptions, some other notes. If you have them in columns, you can export that in, and import them easily into Jira. Epics and components are a little trickier. Epics are just another version of a ticket. So this is the first one we'll do, which is really easy because it's the same thing as importing your stories, except that you just say it's an epic. And once you have an epic list, now you can drag all your tickets over and associate them to that epic much more quickly. Most importantly is that all your projects will start now to be more consistent, meaning one person says they have an issue on you know, some epic Somebody on another project knows what you're talking about because they have the same epic on their project. And that means you have now some equal weighting to figure out effort because on one project, this epic took us X amount of hours. Now I'm coming to this new project. How many hours is it going to take me? Well, on the last one, it took me 10 hours. So now you have some better equivalence in terms of reporting and a feedback loop. If you're really into this kind of stuff, you know, over the course of a year or two, now you have a lot of projects to start measuring against and figuring out what kind of budget you want to plan for. And as a, pro, as a business owner, that's really what you want. How efficient is my team? Can I accurately estimate how much this project is going to cost me? Um, and then for developers, obviously they come on to a project knowing that it's the same naming, naming uh, convention from one project to another makes things a lot easier. One person will call something one thing and another person calls it another get rid of that, make it all the same, make it uniform, standardize it. You may have your own nomenclature for your own projects. Make them all the same on all your projects, right? Okay, so what I'm showing here on the right-hand side is, you know, you create a ticket and you want to be able to associate it to an epic easily. So if those epics are already there, as you start creating those, those stories, the product owner starts creating those stories, they can associate them easily to the epics that you're starting them with, right? Lead them down the path. You don't want to let them just start creating stuff. Give them a starter list, and that's what this epic list is supposed to be. For components, it's the same thing. Remember that long list of three columns that I gave at the beginning? If I have that already existing in Jira, all they have to do is just start typing the first couple of letters, and it automatically makes a match. And now you have a preset list of things to identify tickets with. Okay? All right. So. The good news is importing epics into Jira is really, really easy. All you have to do is go up to issues, import from CSV, match up your file, and boom, you're done. That's it. I mean, we'll do a, dime, a, a live demo. Now, um, that epics list, that's also in GitHub. So I have a CSV file up there. You can download it, edit it, play with it, and use that as an epics list to start with. Customize it. Um, it's just a CSV file. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, components is a little trickier. Components, unfortunately, they, in order for you to import a ticket which has components assigned to it, the components have to be existing in the project already. This is the catch. So there's one API endpoint, which is for a component. So how do I import 50 components? I go to this website URL 50 times. No, we use Postman. Has anybody here heard of Postman or used it? Okay, so Postman is an API tool that allows you, you can script it really easily to make repetitive calls. So if that API that I gave you at the very beginning with the JQL is of interest, download Postman, put in the credentials for your Jira instance and start playing with your queries and you'll get the JSON result back in that tool and it's nicely formatted. You don't have to go to 
JSON lint and clean it up so you can read it. But for our purposes, because I got to put in 50, actually 44 components, I use Postman because I can attach a script to it and use placeholders to take a CSV file and put the two together and do 44 calls to that API endpoint and boom, I have a components list. So this sounds really complicated, right? So how about we do a demo because it'll be a lot easier. So put this somewhere, okay. So be careful with this cable here so hopefully I don't lose my. All right, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. This is horrible. This will work. I didn't break anything, right? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Whew. That's always the first goal of the session. All right. So what I've got here, this is my Jira backlog, right? You saw this before. Um, there's a bunch of tickets in here, right? They're color coded, nice, happy. And if I click over here on the left, I have some epics that are already existing. So if I have a ticket, right, you drag it and you can assign it to an epic. Easy. If I go to components, I have a list of components, and this is a version of the list that I gave you. If I try to import tickets into this project with components, it'll work because they're there. If I go to a new project, and I'm called it Baltimore, so I have no tickets, I have no epics, and I have no components, right? So the other way to do this is just type them in over and over again for every project, and nobody wants to do that. So let's put them all in automatically. All right, so let's start with the epics. All right, let's go back to the backlog. Can everybody see this okay? Is this big enough, hopefully? Okay, so here under epics, you see there's nothing there. So I'm just gonna go to issues, import from CSV. I find my file and I went up to GitHub, Chris Urban, and I downloaded the file. So there's my sample epics list, right? Now, I've also actually uploaded an existing configuration file because if you really want to be lazy, and there's not a lot of work here, you could actually download the configuration file and upload that too. You don't need to, you really don't. Just download that one file. And it will match it, you'll tell it where to put it. And I say, I want to put it here and be more. Don't worry about the next. And now I match up the fields. And there's only five fields in my file. The description, so I match that to my description. The epic name. I match that to my epic name. You see where this is going? <laughs> Issue type. Because I thought about all this ahead of time and named the columns correctly. Priority and summary. And it'll say, okay, let me do a quick check. I could validate it and I'll say, mm -hmm -hmm, yeah, this will work. 19 epics will be created. All right, begin. You get the fancy progress bar that everybody knows and loves, boom. And now if I go back to my Baltimore project and I see, behold, are all my epics. Okay, easy. Components, this is a little harder. Now Postman looks like this. And hopefully you can see this, it's really kind of dim. I can make that a little bit bigger. Okay, how would I do this? Okay. Now, the way this works in Postman, um, what you've got is basically a couple of uh, ingredients. You've got a destination address, which is that API endpoint that I told you about. I'm using, in this case, I don't know if you can see this here, localhost 8888, because it's my, it's my Jira on my laptop. We don't have Wi-Fi that kind of sucks, so I'm doing this locally. Um, but it would be your Atlassian.net, it's your local server, whatever that URL is, that's what you fill in. The rest, yeah, see what I did there, is the same for every JIRA instance. So REST API 2 slash component in this case. All right, this is the complex one. So let me take a step back to the beginning where we were talking about a real simple query like show me all my projects. This is one of those endpoints in that REST API list. All you have to do is um, add and I wrote this all out in the GitHub uh, readme. You need to add your authorization, which I've already done here, but you basically go in and do basic auth and then type in your 
Jira instance username and password. Once you have this here and you hit um, update or save, it will add it as an authorization string with a base 64 encoded thing. That is that, you know, gobbledygook that you saw in that earlier code snippet. That's the translation of my username and password hashed as base64. All I need to add is that it's sending application JSON so that the endpoint knows I'm sending them JSON. And I query the project. And if I hit send, I get, oh, of course I get back. <laughs> oh, I wonder if that's because I zoomed. Um, I should get back a JSON script. That's a weird one. Um, I love live demos. Um, you get a list of um, you get a list of the projects that are in your local Jira instance, and it's in that same JSON format with name of the name of the project, number of the issues, who created it, when was it created, all those all those data points. All right, so you can go on from there and add other things. Now that I know my project, I can go back and get the list of components. I could go back and add a specific component, and so this one is the one I'm talking about right here this create a single component. This is saved from Postman as a collection. That's what these things on the left-hand side are called. And that setting file is what's in the GitHub. So if you download the create or add a component collection for Postman, open up your Postman instance and import it, you'll see the exact same thing here. All you need to do, in, do is again enter your authorization, save it, and then you need to customize one thing. And that is, what's the project that I'm adding these components to? P more, right? So now I have that. This tells the Postman instance to take the component name and the component's description from another CSV file. And every time I go through that list, it's gonna post that component and that description. And it's gonna do one, two, three, four, five, all the way through the entire list, right? Okay, so now we have this. I go to runner. I told you this was gonna be hardcore. And now I select that collection that I had, add components. I'm gonna tell it, because I happen to know there's 44 files, uh, 44 rows, and I go to my components, descriptions, JSON, source file. So in this source file, and so you'll see what that looks like. Of course, I don't have it open. Yeah. No, I didn't record it. I didn't record the demos themselves, but there are screenshots and those are in the GitHub readme. So you can see uh, screen by screen what I'm showing you. So that JSON file that I'm uploading, this is what it looks like. It's literally just a name and a description. And I'm going a little hog wild with the description. You probably don't need it, but you do need that original name. So that list that I showed you at the beginning with all those components, that's all in this one JSON file. So what I'm basically doing is telling Postman, go through this list, take the next one, post it to my local Jira instance, which creates a component. Go back to the list, take the next one, post another component, 44 times. Right, so I pick that one, and you can test to make sure it works by hitting preview, and yes, you get the things I just showed you, right? It's reading the component, it's reading the description. And I just fire away. And yes, you will get a 400 bad request, which you can ignore. But if I go back to my project, which was where? I lost my, there we go. Oops, what happened did I do? Maybe I missed something, what did I not? Oh, you know what, I didn't save the, uh, there we go. It would help if I save this, there we go. There we go, 201, that's what I should get. See, this is an awesome live demo when we get to do debugging. And now if I refresh, there are all my components loaded and ready to go, and so on and so on. So you just saved yourself a little typing. Now, it took us, what, five minutes to do this? 
for one project, rather than type in 44 components for every single project, you can add this to, let's say, your project setup uh, ritual. When you're opening a new project for a customer or opening a new project for um, another job, part of your setup process is creating a new instance, a new project in Jira, adding these components and adding all of those epics that we just listed. And now everybody has that same starting point. So now when I go back to my backlog and you're doing grooming, you create a new ticket, whatever I'm putting in there, I can start automatically typing in, you know, news, and automatically my content type, my component shows up. And the epics that I wanted to list to, let's say, that, there we go, news releases. That's the epic. In this case, they're both named the same, but you get, you get the idea. Okay? All right. That's the live demo. Let's go back to PowerPoint real quick. Any questions on that? That's a lot to absorb, right? We're all going to go back and watch the recording again. <laughs> all right, so all those pieces that I just talked about, they're all here under Agile Drupal in GitHub. The epics list, the Jira import config file, if you need it, you want to go crazy, uh, you don't actually need it. The components list itself, which is that JSON that I showed you and the Postman setup files. So all you have to do is just import them into Postman, update to your local URL, your local authorization, and you're ready to go. All right, so what did we learn? Document everything. We went through all of these things here. Um, there's a lot to go that we went through. Um, you know, like I said, if you have any questions, let's talk, let's ask. Uh, and uh, you can catch me at the Aquia booth downstairs. Um, we skipped over a couple of things. We'll talk about them later. Here's my contact info. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm happy to talk about this in more detail. All right, thanks, guys. Oh, well, uh, one more thing. I'm supposed to show you the uh, contribution sprints on Friday. If anybody's interested in the conference organizing distribution, COD, we're working on that for D8. There's a BOF for that next, and we're going to be sprinting on it on Friday. Thanks.